Well, hello everybody and welcome um, to uh, another Research in Action session. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Pranay Sushadri, um, who will present uh, eQuadratures, which is an open source modeling platform um, developed by um, a data centric engineering team at Turing. Pranay is a um, lecturer at Imperial and a group leader at Turing within the data centric engineering group. And he's also uh, a founder of eQuadratures. So I'm really delighted to welcome Pranay to tell us about how this uh, toolkit has been developed and what it can kind of do ideally for your projects, your work, your organizations. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we dive in. There is a link in the chat that I've just posted. I'll just paste again for any late joiners. Uh, it, uh, there's a link to a Google Doc, which is just a shared doc for our session today to take notes collaboratively. Um, it'd be great if you could let us know who you are and sort of what, you know, what, what your institution and tell us a little bit about um, what you hope to get out of the session today. And if you've got any kind of general notes and observations, please just add those in the document. We'll pick those up. Um, either directly today uh, during the session and if we don't have time we'll come back to you later and uh, you are very welcome to ask questions throughout the presentation there'll be a dedicated kind of Q&A at the end uh, but throughout the presentation you're welcome to ask questions in the chat function on the right directly here in the hop-in or you can also put your questions in the Google Doc I will monitor both and um, if you would like to verbally ask your question, then you'll have to unmute yourself. And the way that works um, on hopping on, on this platform is, well, I hope you can see an orange button at the top right corner of your screen that says share video and audio. You have to click that button. I'll approve you on this side and then you can just unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Um, so I hope that will make sense. If you've got any procedural questions, obviously just put them in the chat. I'll get back to you quickly. And um, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Pranay um, to tell us about eQuadratures. Thank you, Ada. Um, and thank you all for, for joining. Um, I put together this uh, pack of slides um, with the intention of trying to reach two uh, relatively different audiences. On the one hand, folks who um, are actually doing the implementation, the coding, uh, the deep dive, as it were, and then on the other hand, folks who are um, at a higher level, perhaps in, in, in more of a managerial capacity, um, something to, to whet their appetite, to, to pique their interest in uh, some of the work that, that we're doing. Um, and so perhaps it's worth starting with who the we is. Um, so eQuadratures was originally started in 2016, and we have um, been incredibly um, um, supported by uh, a global team of contributors, um, aside from the core development team that includes uh, Andrew, Bryn, and Chunyi, uh, and myself, uh, among, uh, among a few. Um, additionally, we've been supported by um, a fantastic research management team uh, at the Turing uh, with Katie and Jennifer. Uh, and we've also been very incredibly lucky, really, uh, to have been supported through various different uh, um, fundings um, and schemes, as a few of which are enumerated on the slide. So in terms of the, the full narrative, the full story, we started this, this project in 2016. We released the first version of the code on GitHub. Um, and then in 2017, we, we really got our, our um, teeth um, in a, um, an industrial problem. And this was effectively a case study uh, with Rolls-Royce. Following that, the code uh, was used in UKAA, the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, McLaren, the United States Geological Survey, or USGS. Uh, and then in 2019, the Alan Turing Institute um, supported the project via the um, ASG grant, um, as well as funding from the Lloyd Register Foundation, once again through the Data Centric Engineering Program, as Ada alluded to. Um, and since then, we have been going from strength to strength. Um, in terms of where we are today, um, obviously we've added a lot of capability into the code um, and I'll share uh, a bit about uh, some of that capability, but at a very high level, uh, today we have roughly 45,000 downloads uh, that we've amassed over the last two, two and a half years. Um, and the code is being used in a, in a plethora of uh, companies, 
uh, in government uh, and in academia as well. And once again, the, the driving ethos behind this project uh, and everything that we do in terms of uh, the applications that come out of eQuadratures is underscored by um, this open source ethos. In terms of where it stands uh, compared to some of the other open source, the bigger open source uh, codes that you find online, um, I'd like to think that eQuadratures sits on top of NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and Seaborn uh, with a specific task of achieving certain objectives. In other words, if you wanted to do a sensitivity analysis study, if you wanted to do UQ or uncertainty quantification, if you wanted to build a surrogate model, if you wanted to uh, numerically integrate a function, um, or if you wanted to more generally um, undertake some sort of digital twinning, uh, eQuadratures is the solution for many of those tasks. Uh, more mathematically, effectively, what eQuadratures is really good at is approximating functions, uh, optimizing over them, and integrating over them, um, as well as uh, solving an inverse problem of a certain kind. So approximate, optimize, integrate, and invert. Um, those are the four pillars, if you will, of, of eQuadratures. Uh, once again, at a higher level, uh, what eQuadratures does as a model development platform is it's able to ingest both real-world uh, data as well as simulation data. Uh, to be able to build models, and it can do both of them in tandem, uh, which is something I will talk about towards the end of this presentation. It can build very simple yet explainable models um, using uh, some of the machinery that I will introduce to you as we progress. Um, it can rapidly train models without high, high cloud costs, and that's really one of the, the strengths of eQuadratures. Is if you wanted to train a model, um, it would take you just uh, a few seconds, um, as opposed to other um, distinct uh, model platforms that uh, might take several hours, if not days. Uh, and then finally, uh, and this is uh, a new capability where we, we, we're going to be releasing in version 10, um, it's that eQuadratures can audit uh, its deployed models and it can also audit the models built by other platforms. And perhaps the most important thing, all of this goodness is just uh, three words away. So if you have um, uh, uh, a, a laptop, you can download eQuadratures even right now uh, through pip install eQuadratures. It's also available uh, through Conda by Conda install eQuadratures. Okay, so what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is quickly uh, go through a few what I call rapid fire applications. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, uh, but I will try to go into sufficient detail so it gives you some sense of what, um, what exactly was achieved uh, using eQuadratures. Uh, so, at a very high level, um, what I'm showing you here is a uncertainty quantification study. More fundamentally, it is a comparison between Monte Carlo, which is one of the, one might consider the workhorses of UQ, of uncertainty quantification. And this is just a comparison between what you get with standard Monte Carlo versus what you get with eQuadratures. Um, and this is for a variety of different functions. So here's another one. Uh, and once again, this is just an analytical test case. But it really shows you the strength, the numerical power of eQuadratures uh, in terms of being able to deliver uncertainty quantification estimates. What you're actually seeing on the screen is an exponential convergence in the output quantity of interest, which in this case is the error in estimating the mean. And once again, this all boils down to the underpinning numerical um, bits that we've coded in eQuadratures, uh, more of which I will uh, discuss later on. Here's another example that we see all too often, and this actually formed uh, the, the baseline for one of, one of the case studies that I'll share with you later on. Uh, so imagine, if you will, um, you're given a data set. So in this case, it's a data set pertaining to a certain piston. So you have piston mass, you have piston area, you have a gas temperature, and then you have the quantity of interest or the, the output quantity that you're uh, uh, really uh, interested in either maximizing and minimizing or in a, a more generally um, in really understanding. Uh, we have the cycle time. Um, and throughout engineering, um, one always finds folks asking the question, well, I have this data set and I'm interested in the cycle time, but I'm interested in understanding which of my inputs is important with respect to the cycle time. And eQuadratures is perfectly poised to answer such a question. Moreover, it can provide that answer to you um, in a very unique way, as I will demonstrate. For the data available, the polynomial approximation had a square value of 1. This indicates a very good fit. Additionally, the most important parameter, 
based on the total Sobel indices, was found to be parameter to the area. So what you just heard um, is effectively an output, uh, one of the different outputs you can get from equometers. Um, so given a few lines of code, um, as you see on the screen, uh, particulars about the, the area, the mass, uh, the pressure, the, uh, and uh, the other uh, inputs, um, it's able to fit a model, basically a polynomial, to the data. Uh, and from that polynomial, uh, which is constructed very efficiently, it's able to output the Sobel indices or metrics for sensitivity. And it's able to inform the user also of the, the quality of the fit associated with the model it's built. Here's another case study, uh, slightly distinct. Um, and so this is one pertaining to predicting the prices of houses, which one would consider is a very standard or classical uh, machine learning task. Um, rather than use a single global polynomial, which we know for a variety of reasons is ill-equipped to deal with the, um, the nature of the data, uh, what we've baked into equadratures is its ability to, to fit together piecewise models. Um, and so the advantage of that is that in the same vein as you saw before, or you heard before, um, it's able to estimate sensitivity indices based on each local polynomial. And so this is just an example of what you can get out. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen right now um, is effectively a categorization of different houses based on their latitude and the longitude, which is something that the code has inferred. Um, and it's also been able to infer how, depending on where you are, um, the sensitivity metrics, i.e. what really drives your house price, is, is dictated by different conditions. So for instance, in, in regions that are red, you see that um, uh, the average occupancy has a greater um, sensitivity than in regions that are dark blue, as indicated over here. So the, the, the take home message really, from this slide um, at least, is that you can fit multiple polynomial models. Uh, and once again, we'll delve deeper into why we use polynomials, what kinds of polynomials, and how we regress them. Here's another one. This is this is perhaps for those folks who 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 are from an engineering background, specifically a computational fluid dynamics background. Um, this is a really nice use case for uh, equadratures again. Uh, so the objective here is to predict um, a relatively complex function, uh, which is the Reynolds stress discrepancy function. That's a variety of different parameters in a turbulent uh, flow field. So this is just a demonstration of what you can get with the decision tree, a eight neural network, an eight layer neural network and a poly tree or what we have baked into equadratures. Um, now, in full disclosure, um, you, I'm fairly certain you could optimize the structure of the neural network to get far better predictions, but this is just um, uh, a demonstration of what you can get with a very basic polynomial tree as code in equadratures. Um, and you see we get far better uh, predictions than uh, some of the other techniques out there. I really like this one. Uh, so once again, um, apologies if we're going through these quite rapidly, um, but then again, that, that that is the idea to give you a taste of where equadratures can and has been used. Um, so it's incredibly challenging to estimate or predict the entire flow field. So imagine if you will, you're given a plethora of different designs, you have computed either a computational fluid dynamics or a, com a computational structural dynamics simulation. And what you're looking at in this specific case um, are the uh, effectively the pressure contours around an airfoil. And the exam question is the following. Given an arbitrarily new design, can we faithfully predict what the pressure looks like? And also, can we do that instantly? Um, and turns out we can with the quadratures. So this is just an example of uh, a completely brand new airfoil that was, was generated. Um, and the result that we get from e quadratures versus the result that we get from a state of a relatively state of the art convolutional neural network. Now, what you're looking at on the screen are the contours of the error and velocity prediction. In other words, what is the difference between the model and the truth um, on a log scale? And you can clearly tell that we're getting a far better prediction from e quadratures. Uh, once again, using a series of polynomials in a very particular way. Uh, more of which I will, I will share later on. So that really summarizes some of the rapid fire applications, um, but there's, there's rest assured there's more to come. I thought that I should structure this pr presentation um, in terms of three different segments. Uh, in the first segment, I'm going to talk to you a bit more about polynomials, the kinds of polynomials we use, and I'll talk about projections, um, because it turns out for a lot of reasons, you don't actually want to fit polynomials to especially high dimensional data. 
Uh, and then finally, talk about how polynomials with projections uh, gives us um, access to some incredible model development capabilities um, and a few case studies associated with them. Let's start with polynomials. Once again, this is, this is really fundamental stuff. Um, at a very high level, what we're trying to do is approximate a function. Um, and so f of x represents our function, our model, uh, something that we're interested in, and p of x represents a polynomial that we're trying to um, use to emulate uh, the function f of x. Now, in the context of computer models and surrogates, um, this paradigm um, is all too apparent um, when one studies the following diagram on the screen. So imagine you have some sort of geometry or perhaps boundary conditions that you parameterized in the context of a computational simulation, whether that's an ANSYS model, a COMSOL model, um, a star CCM or an SU squared, doesn't really matter. And naturally you're getting some sort of output quantity of interest from this model, the lift to drag ratio, um, the, uh, the stresses uh, integrated across a specific area. Um, the objective really is to be able to understand what the impact of an uncertainty in the input parameters are. In other words, we're going from a paradigm where X is deterministic to one where X has some variability, some uncertainty, some probability distribution associated with it. And the question then becomes, well, what is the impact of that probability distribution on the outputs? That same paradigm exists even when one, one deals with data sets. In other words, you have um, a tabulated data set where you've varied some input parameters and you're interested in ascertaining, well, if I had an uncertainty, a certain kind of uncertainty in inputs, what is the impact on the outputs? Now that's very related to this idea of being able to build a surrogate model to the data as provided. This really leads us to the first step of the code. Um, and I'm, as, as we go by, I'm going to start to introduce to you some of the syntax that we use um, in, in e quadratures. So we, we start off every notebook or every coding uh, assignment that we have with the quadratures with the definition of the parameter. So in this case, we have X, which represents our, our, our parameter. Um, and that can be uh, represented by some distribution. Usually if you don't have, um, if you just have a range, we would assign a uniform distribution uh, to, to said parameter X. Um, naturally, depending on the kind of distribution, we, we have the flexibility to define uh, a wide array of different distributions, as well as distributions that don't necessarily have an analytical form. So, for instance, if you just have data, uh, we can uh, use that as well to basically define this parameter X. Now, why would we define this parameter X and where do we use this? Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, a big part of the quadratures is actually about building polynomials. Specifically, we, we use certain kinds of orthogonal polynomials. Um, and the way to think about a polynomial, uh, quite simply, is just a linear, a weighted sum of some basis polynomials. Uh, another way to, to look at that is in terms of a matrix times a vector. Um, so you can imagine you have all these basis polynomials that you stack in a matrix. Uh, these are known, um, so we, we definitely know what these are. Uh, and then we have some unknown model coefficients given by the alphas. And what really what we're trying to find for a given function, we call, we're trying to approximate our function f of x using a polynomial, uh, we're trying to ascertain what these unknown model coefficients are. Now, we use orthogonal polynomials uh, because they have some really interesting special properties, especially in the context of uncertainty quantification. Uh, for those that are familiar with, with uncertainty quantification, you're probably also familiar with this idea of polynomial chaos expansions. And in fact, that's really where eQuadratures was born as an open source tool to replicate a lot of the research that we saw, um, this is back a few years ago now, uh, within the remit of polynomial chaos expansions. So once again, we go back to this paradigm where we have uncertainty in the um, um, input parameters. We have some sort of a model uh, and we're trying to quantify what the impact of that uncertainty is on the lift to drag ratio, on integrated stresses, et cetera. So what we do is we replace our expensive computational simulation with the surrogate, a polynomial P of X, um, and we, we select the basis terms, the line item that I said was deterministic. So here I said that the, uh, the matrix uh, on the right-hand side, the first matrix of the different polynomial bases, those are known. And in fact, those are selected based on what the uncertainty is. So for instance, if you have a Gaussian uncertainty we use, 
uh, Hermit polynomials, if you have a uniform uncertainty, we use Legendre polynomials, and so on. And the reason we do that is just because we can then uh, estimate the mean to be effectively the first coefficient and the variance to be the sum of the squares of all remaining coefficients. And basically, there are these really nice properties for computing um, integral quantities uh, that turns out you can quickly ascertain just by inspection. So I just look at the, the mean coefficient and I know something about uh, the impact of certain uncertainty on my model. So in essence, you can really think of our approximation problem as, as the following, that I have f of x and I'm trying to approximate it with p transpose x alpha, where alpha is the unknown. Once again, uh, we know what p of x is because we know what the uncertainties, usually we know what the uncertainties are in, 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 in this kind of modeling paradigm. One way to solve this, although there are any number, um, is by least squares, uh, where you effectively um, solve the following two known problems. So you have a few uh, evaluations of your model, F, um, and based on that, you're able to uh, solve this by QR factorization um, uh, amongst a variety of different other techniques. Okay, so there is, however, a problem with what I've just said, and I'm going to now enumerate what exactly the problem is. Um, so if, if you think about it classically, polynomial interpolation or regression requires at least as many model evaluations as unknown coefficients. If I think of trying to fit a quadratic model, um, I need uh, three uh, model evaluations. I need to be able to evaluate my model at three different locations. Um, if I'm trying to construct a model in two dimensions, a quadratic model in two dimensions, including the mixed terms, then obviously I have nine unknowns. And then if I try to do it in three dimensions, I have 27 unknowns and so on. And so um, as you probably gauge, as we go to higher and higher dimensions, this cost rises exponentially, which obviously isn't, isn't a good thing. Now, one can reduce uh, the number of model evaluations for certain problems uh, using a variety of different techniques. These include reduce the order in each dimension, uh, reduce the number of basis terms. So you want to reduce the higher order interaction terms, um, or you can utilize some sort of regression or some sort of sparsity. Um, in other words, you assume that most of the unknown alphas or a significant majority of the unknown alphas are zero or close to zero. And so this idea was actually something that we uh, really got us started. So we uh, we had a paper, I think it was back in 2017 now, uh, titled Effectively Subsampled Quadratures, and that's really where e quadratures was, was born. Uh, this idea of being able to parsimoniously um, evaluate your high dimensional uh, model or data set um, and being able to extract a polynomial model from that, a polynomial surrogate that, that captures um, your the variability associated with your high dimensional model. Uh, and that really formed the first case study that we did, which was with the United States Geological Survey. Uh, this was for uh, being able to better understand the impact of coastal hydrodynamics on vegetation. Um, Effectively, the problem statement as it stands is that underwater seagrass uh, protects our um, coastlines by reducing the impact of storms. And being able to understand the different environmental factors that threaten that is of vital importance. Um, and so when they came to us, the United States Geological Survey, they wanted to perform a sensitivity analysis uh, very similar to the one that you heard uh, a few slides before. Um, and they wanted a really quick turnaround um, and the reason they wanted that was because they quickly wanted to, to implement, make some sort of a decision based on the output of this sensitivity analysis task. So what you're seeing really is a comparison between what e quadratures, which is what they ended up using, uh, took them two days or well, two and a half days, uh, whereas another commercial package would have taken them roughly 14 days. Um, and the reason for that that cost is because of the number of model evaluations and the cost associated with each model evaluation itself. So each model evaluation itself took four to five hours. Um, and so that's where um, you know, the cost really starts to, uh, to increase. Um, and as you can see from this uh, schematic, uh, we were able to significantly reduce the cost compared to this other commercial package. That obviously was, was, was really good as well. Um, let, let, that be, let that be known. <laughs> okay. So, so it turns out for some problems, you can you can play around with the, the, the bases, the kind of sparsity as well, and, and uh, as a consequence, reduce the number of model evaluations that are required, as, as mentioned before. However, for higher dimensional problems, a distinct strategy is required uh, in order to 
avoid what's classically known as the curse of dimensionality, i.e. my model has too many parameters. Um, because obviously as your model's parameters increase, um, that uh, leads to uh, in, uh, a data analyst or an engineer suffering from the curse of dimensionality as I've tried to articulate. Uh, I'll be a bit poorly in this, in this cartoon. And that brings us nicely to projections. Um, so very loosely, the, the kind of dimension reduction we do in e-quadratures um, is similar to PCA, but distinct in the sense that we are trying to reduce our data, project our data onto some subspace, but that subspace has to be driven by the variation of the function. And that's where it's, it's quite distinct from, from regular PCA. Um, and so uh, principally what we're trying to do really is identify a matrix M and be able to project the data over the space associated with, uh, with this matrix. So let me just uh, provide a few numbers here because uh, that'll hopefully help, uh, or it'll make it easier to digest these in the, the next few slides. Imagine if you will, D is 25. Um, I've chosen it for, for a good reason, as you will see. So imagine D is 25 um, and N is two. Um, and so effectively, instead of this model, this, this data set that I'm about to introduce you to be a function of 25 variables, by projecting it, we are we're hopefully trying to have a model of two variables only. Now, before we delve into the actual case study, um, I just wanted to give you some perspective on dimension reduction uh, for, well, for a variety of reasons, but one, because I think this is quite interesting uh, from a geometrical standpoint. So imagine if you will, um, you're given a cube, right? So you're given this, this three-dimensional cube uh, and you're projecting it on a plane. So imagine you have a light source, you have a cube, and then you have a plane, much like, much like um, as shown in this diagram, uh, we have a human being walking and, and obviously they have a shadow and a shadow is effectively a 2D projection in this case of a three-dimensional object. So depending on the orientation of your cube, you could end up with something that has four edges or six edges, right? Depending on, on how you rotate it with respect to uh, the light source. So imagine now you take this cube and you fill it with um, quite a few uh, yellow marbles as you see on the screen, right? Depending on the rotation that you have, um, you might probably end up seeing something that looks like this. So this is effectively what we call a zonotope. It's a projection of a, a three-dimensional cube on a two-dimensional plane. Um, and the reason we, we I, I keep saying two a projection on a two-dimensional plane is because um, it's easier to see. Um, obviously, if you project in 2D, um, it's easy to see, it's easy to plot. Um, it's something that you can print out and share with your engineering and your uh, manufacturing folks as well. So if we now increase the dimensionality, um, so now we have a 10-dimensional cube. Um, obviously, we don't know what a 10-dimensional cube looks like, but imagine you have a 10-dimensional cube and you project once again onto a, a 2D plane. This is what you might end up getting. If we go to 50, you get this. Once again, just bear in mind that those um, yellow marbles that I uh, mentioned, uh, there are many of them, and we spread them uniformly. So within the cube, we spread them uniformly, but it turns out when you project, you start to observe this characteristic that they all start to cluster towards the center. Um, and if anything, this really gives you a sense of how big the volume associated in this case with a three-dimensional, 300-dimensional cube is. Uh, just the number of edges is massive. Um, and at the, if you have, for instance, a 300-dimensional problem, it's virtually impossible for you to be able to evaluate models at all the different edges, if, if, if at the very least that is what you wanted to do. Um, and this really motivates this idea of being able to identify strategies for data-driven dimension reduction uh, within the context of uh, different engineering and manufacturing models. So that nicely brings us to our second case study, which was done um, over a considerable period of time with, with Rolls-Royce. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen is a parametric mesh uh, that defines one of their research fan blades. Um, and so uh, I, uh, at the time, I spent quite a bit of time meshing uh, this, this blade, which is why I, I do include uh, close-ups into the, the hub and the, and the tip mesh for, for folks on the call who have done some CFD. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it, it, it took a lot of effort to get a really good quality result. Anyway, I digress. So um, as part of this study, we, we generate, we ran a design of experiment. Uh, and because of the computational budget, we're very cognizant of the fact that we can't really do a full factorial design. Um, and we need to come up with a more efficient way to explore the design space. Um, 
And so that led us to what I'm about to, to, to share with you. So uh, imagine, if you will, you have run some DOE. So in this case, it was just randomly selected, randomly selected points within um, a 25 dimensional cube. Uh, and what you're seeing here on the different rows are different designs. And here are uh, the, the efficiency and the pressure ratio values for, for this research, uh, for this research play. Now, um, if you were to randomly project, I, in other words, if you were to take M transpose X, um, so where X effectively represents a row um, associated with this, uh, this table, as you see, if you were to randomly project onto uh, an M, um, you would observe something like this. So this is a random 25 by two matrix. Uh, and naturally you don't really observe any structure and, and why would you, it's just a random projection. Um, and so the question therefore is, can we come up with a more structured way to determine what M is to be able to generate effectively the same graphic, but have something useful come out of it. And that nicely leads us to the, the next topic of tying polynomials with projections. So there's a bit of a digression, um, but obviously relevant. Uh, imagine you are in the space of this fan blade, this 25 dimensional fan blade. Um, and obviously there are regions of this 25, within this 25 dimensional hypercube that along which the efficiency or the pressure ratio, whatever uh, output quantity of interest um, it is that, that one is interested in vary a lot. Um, in other words, there are these gradients, um, as you see over there, um, where, uh, so they're gradient values that are large and obviously on the planes, the gradient values are small. So this is just an uh, analogy um, of thinking about your function uh, in terms of a landscape. So you have the mountains and you have the plains. And we're actually interested in identifying what are the linear combinations of the inputs that actually tell us or are indicative of uh, regions where the gradient varies the most. In other words, I'd like to identify the peaks and the valleys as opposed to the flat plains. And so in order to do that, what we do is we move away, we shy away from this idea of being able to approximate our original function with a, with a full polynomial. But indeed, what we try to do is try to approximate, approximate it with a polynomial over a subspace, a projected polynomial, if you will. In other words, P of M transpose X. Um, and so then the problem that we're solving, um, once again, is the two-norm minimization, but it's a little more involved because it requires us to not only ascertain what the coefficients of this polynomial are, but also what the subspace is, i.e. what are the entries of this matrix M that we do not know, in the hope that this matrix provides some sort of structure um, into, uh, um, into this data, in, in at least for the purposes of this case study, we're interested in the efficiency associated with this fan blade in 25 dimensions. So to determine what M is and to determine what alpha is, uh, that's three lines of code in E quadratures. Uh, for the technical folks, uh, what we're effectively doing is we're implementing a version of this beautiful um, uh, algorithm called variable projection, um, which is effectively um, solving this problem um, over the, uh, the Grassmann manifold um, to, to ascertain what the elements of, of M are. Um, and uh, once you've figured out what M is, figuring out the, the coefficients, the polynomial coefficients alpha, that's relatively, that's relatively trivial. So in these three lines of code, you get M and you also get the subspace polynomial um, associated with this projection. And if you're interested in the, the Sobel indices or the moments, that's also just two extra lines of code. Okay, so if we go ahead and implement that, this is what we observe. Now what you're seeing is some real structure. In fact, within reason, one could say that turns out this 25 dimensional problem um, is actually a quadratic over two dimensions. Uh, in other words, when we take this 25 dimensional data, we project it over two dimensions, turns out, lo and behold, the efficiency of this fan research blade is actually quadratic. Um, and now what's interesting is if you study what M transpose X actually is, in other words, if you start looking at the columns of M, um, they actually reveal some really interesting physics. In other words, what linear combination of all your design variables really governs or really drives the efficiency. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that was one uh, uh, interesting factoid that, that came out of this, this case study. On the whole, however, uh, we're able to design these zonotope maps, these projection maps. So once again, because this is a two-dimensional projection, 
um, as you see on the screen. You're, if you just take a bird's eye view of this and uh, fit a response surface through this, in other words, if you use the polynomial, this is what you get. So this is really um, a map that represents a 25 dimensional design space projected on two dimensions. Uh, and what you're seeing on the left-hand side is the, the efficiency subspace map. And on the right-hand side is that for pressure ratio. Um, I won't go into detail, but there are a lot of uh, quantitative trade-off studies that you can then uh, infer, which is obviously of value to, to Rolls-Royce as part of this case study. In other words, if I have to um, increase my, my exit angle by a certain amount, what is, the, what is the impact on the pressure ratio? What is the impact on the efficiency, et cetera? So there are all these trade-off studies that you can quite easily uh, design based on, on these subspace uh, projections um, from, from your quadratures. Okay, the last point I would like to leave you with on the technical front um, is this idea of, uh, once again, going back to this analogy of mountains and uh, peaks and valleys um, and, and the flat plains. Uh, from the perspective of performance, one is really interested in understanding, well, what are the peaks and the valleys? In other words, where can I really increase the efficiency? Where can I uh, control the pressure ratio? But from a manufacturing standpoint, we're actually interested in the flat plains. In other words, where can I vary the, the geometry um, or conditions thereof uh, such that the performance does not vary? Um, in other words, where, where, where can I change things and have it not impact some quantity of interest? Uh, and that idea is actually really powerful for manufacturing. Um, and in fact, we wrote, because there was so much to say about it, about not, not just the idea, but the different computational methodologies we have in equalities to deliver that, um, we, we ended up writing a two-part paper in the ASME Journal of Turbo Machinery that although, once again, there's a very strong um, a turbo machinery application there, as you will see, uh, there are applications to other um, uh, manufacturing uh, areas as well, high-value manufacturing areas. Uh, and the, the long and short of it really is the ability to generate this map, um, this draft, this, this CAD-like drawing that tells you where you can have some variability in where you cannot, depending on certain constraints and certain objectives. Um, and there's a really nice set of blog posts on the Equatures discourse. Um, so if you just go to equatures.org and if you go scroll all the way down, you look at the discourse, um, you'll see a variety of different posts on this singular topic. Um, so in conclusion, um, obviously I haven't shared everything we did uh, with Rolls Royce as part of this case study, but I think it's it's worth highlighting what uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shrok Shapar said. Uh, pertaining to this case study. Um, uh, so you can read the entire quote, but effectively, just to summarize, he said that whilst there are many packages for parameter space analysis and design space exploration, the quadratures is in a league of its own. Um, and at the end of the day, we're able to generate these interpretable models that folks in Rolls-Royce have found very useful um, and still continue to use today. Okay, so uh, in the next just two minutes or so, I'm going to quickly uh, go through uh, some of the upcoming attractions we have as part of the version 10 release, which is coming this week, believe it or not. Um, so for those of you who actually did uh, run the pip install equadratures command, uh, Friday this week, run it again, and you'll have a brand new version of, of the code. Um, so one of the things we're introducing um, is uh, polynomial network graph models. And so this really uh, builds upon some relatively cool research that's come out of Stanford University on how you can uh, build massive models over graphs uh, for uh, regression uh, when you have um, a spatial location becomes very important, just, just like in the example for house prices. Uh, but we're, we're, we're really interested, or rather we've introduced this model because we see a lot of application for CFD and FEM type uh, simulations as well. Uh, we're also introducing a probabilistic uh, toolkit uh, in other words, if you have simulation data and if you have experimental data, as a side note, for those of folks who actually work with CFD and FEM, you'll note that um, it is very difficult to get your, your best simulations to match reality. And that's primarily because uh, there are always uncertainties that uh, one uh, has not factored or, or certain um, uh, things that one cannot model within, within the simulation. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to give any number of examples on this. Um, in fact, that's what I spent the bulk of the last two years working on. But that aside, the reason we've introduced this is to account for that mismatch between simulations and um, um, uh, and real data, as well as to acknowledge the fact that typically in most modeling endeavors, you'll have a series of different models. So you'll have a low fidelity one, you'll have a, a mid fidelity one, and then perhaps you'll have a high fidelity one with 
with different runtimes for associated with each of them. So just to crystallize that, um, here's a very, very good example. Once again, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but um, feel free to ask queries about this later on. So what, what you see over here is um, uh, a snippet of data from uh, a von Karman Institute experimental case study. Um, and you also see some CFD. Uh, now this was for three different parameters that were varied. Uh, and the output quantity of interest in this case is a surface integrated uh, heat, heat transfer. Now, what you will note almost instinctively is that the CFD doesn't match the experiment. In fact, the trends aren't always consistent as well. So it's not that there's a consistent shift between the CFD and the experiment. However, what we've done in the quadratures, um, once again, this is building upon some, some recent research that, that, that we have done as well, um, is be able to use the CFD despite the fact that it's not entirely accurate. Uh, with respect to the surface integrated heat transfer. In other words, the CFD is yielding some important physics, but it's not capturing everything that we need. But the, the challenge is how do we isolate things that are important that we feel can add value to a model uh, that combines both of them, that assimilates both different, both distinct data sources. So here's just a quick example. So if you were to try to fit a model directly to the experimental data um, using the Bayesian formalism that we've baked into the code, uh, you don't really get any good results. However, if you combine the CFD and the experiment in quadratures, once again, it's just a few lines of code, you can uh, have a model, as you see on the right-hand side, that delivers a really crisp uh, fit to, to the data. So this is something that, that we're really proud of because it's a really nice way, principled way, to fuse simulation and experimental data, especially when they don't necessarily agree. Um, Finally, for those folks who have used e uh, we recognize that some of the syntax is perhaps a bit verbose. And so in version 10, we're really streamlining uh, the syntax. So in other words, if you want to fit a model, if you want to do UQ, or if you wanted to uh, do some dimension reduction, all of those uh, functions will now just be one line of code. Um, and obviously you can delve into the documentation to understand what exactly the code is doing uh, later on. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, questions, any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Pranay, and we've had, and thank you to Jack, Lindsay, and Patricia, who've already asked questions. Um, so, uh, Lindsay, Patricia, Jack, you're very welcome to join the session and unmute yourselves. Um, as a reminder, you would join by clicking on this orange button at the um, kind of right. Um, corner of your screen. Um, so I think I see Jack. Hopefully, yes, you'll be able. OK, so we can hear you. Perfect. So can you ask a question? Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk, Renee. It was interesting. Um, so my question was, uh, could you comment on the relationship between the uh, polynomial chaos type approach used by e and a Gaussian process, which is something I'm much more familiar with? Um, are they basically the same thing if the eigenfunctions of the Gaussian process kernel correspond to the particular polynomial space used in the PC expansion? Um, yes. So if you do have a um, polynomial basis, um, then, uh, and this is also what we show in, in our latest paper, um, effectively a polynomial with an orthogonal, effectively a Gaussian process with an orthogonal polynomial kernel um, is, is what we have. Um, so there is there's a one-to-one -one parity. Now, uh, the, the a distinction arises uh, based on the way one chooses points and the way one adapts the basis terms. Uh, and so that's something that uh, from um, is, is arguably slightly distinct to a lot of the PC literature out there, um, at least the, you know, thinking about uh, literature from uh, the, the early 2000s uh, on, on polynomial chaos expansions. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been a, a strong effort on being able to have uh, accommodate a wide variety of basis terms, as well as have flexibility in the way we um, uh, compute the coefficients and correspondingly, therefore, what the design of experiment is. Um, and that's where there's been uh, quite a bit of innovation. Um, and then obviously there's kind of the, aside from, from those points, there's also obviously the, the idea of just um, cost, right? So standard GPs, as we were all too well aware, has order n cubed. Um, and that's primarily because of the, the, the cost associated with matrix inversion, whereas here it's just um, a, a vector matrix multiplication, because once you have your basis, it's, it's, it's trivial to, once you have your basis and your model, co model evaluations, it's trivial to determine what the, uh, the coefficients are.
Thanks. Hi, can you hear me, Pranam Prane? Oh, hi. Uh, uh, yes, Patricia, I can hear you. Hi, sorry, this system is a bit <laughs> awkward. Anyway, so your ID, I think it is very neat and it really uh, brings the GLM IDs to polynomial. But some, would, do you think some st stochastic method would achieve the same result as well? Um, I think, it, it, I suppose it would vary based on the, um, the application. Uh, that's probably the, the best way to, um, to state that because obviously with generalized linear models, there's a lot of, um, there a lot of advantages. Um, but that said, what you can do is you can, you know, fit a generalized linear model, but then, you know, choose uh, orthogonal polynomial basis terms. So there's, there's quite a bit, I suppose there's, there's not really, there, there is a lot of overlap um, just because of, of yes. the fact that polynomial approximations and the basis terms used are quite universal. And obviously they, they, they're they used in a variety and have been used in a variety of different uh, areas as well. But really the, the focus of e-quadratures as a project, as an open source project has been to, uh, be a consistent repository of tools for initially uncertainty quantification, but now we're moving more into um, into larger models, into Bayesian models, um, but really leverage the the advantage of having orthogonal polynomial basis terms, and that really boils down to the the rapid computation associated with, with coefficients, but also uh, the the um, the interpretability that you get. In other words. Yes, I can use the regular van der Maan based polynomial basis for, for a lot of these efforts, and I probably get good results. But, well, modulo high dimension condition numbers, set that aside. But um, it's really, I can look at the coefficients, but I'll get nothing from them. Whereas if I use an orthogonal polynomial basis, then I study the coefficients and I already know something about my model, um, not just its output moments, but also its sensitivities. And so that that's really um, kind of the, the evolution of this project is. Uh, use orthogonal polynomial basis terms for all the different models that we build. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. We have uh, Farhan has just joined as well. Did you have a question? Hello. Uh, hi. Hi, Pranay. So my, um, sorry. Um, sorry. So my question is, is more applied side of it. So if I have a, if I have two large matrices, uh, one is designed with more structure and one is uh, more random. And if I want to see, like if I just want to verify um, how structured or in terms of, let's say, in terms of rank, uh, one matrix uh, is among these two. Can I use this um, platform to do that? Um, I'm inclined to say no, because um, in what you described, it seems that you have two different matrices. Uh, just once again, I'm just going to repeat what you said, just so I've understood it. Um, so you have two different matrices. One seems to be a bit more uh, structured than the other. And your query is, can you use equadratures to get some sort of information about the structure? Is that, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so, some kind of information or just, uh, let's say I want to say one matrix is more structured than other. If there any quantifiable way or any, any kind of quantity uh, this platform can give me or anything that kind of says is less uncertain or most uncertain something like um, that only only if one of the one or two of the columns associated with your matrix if you imagine you have like 10 different columns but if one or two of those columns are dependent on the first uh seven to eight then yes that you you, you can just if you're able to separate the columns uh in other words you're able to delineate between inputs and outputs um then you can um in the same vein uh as, as I showed before, where we typically have some sort of a data set where you have sample inputs X's and then you have a Y, um, then you can. Um, otherwise, I think it's it's a uh, it's a distinct it's it's a 
perhaps arguably a, a slightly different problem from, from the one that uh, uh, you can use this code for. Um, Okay, so thank you very much for this. Um, I'll I'll just give it a go. We'll probably have a look into the paper. Um, I have another question. How um, the scalability? So if the matrices or data is quite large, if I have let's say ten thousand example, or let's say the matrix size is ten thousand by eight hundred and five hundred, right? So is there any scalability problem because I think underlying there are Bayesian going on. Um, so based on what you said, I'm assuming you have um, 500 different columns. Um, so you said 10,000 by 500, 10,000 by, by 800. So I'm assuming you have effectively 500 different parameters. So I'm almost inclined to, 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 to suggest that I would just uh, do some sort of PCA on that matrix, um, figure out you know what, what are the leading uh, directions in, your, in the space of in 500D um and, and 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 go from there but unless you're unless you're not able to delineate between input and output uh, i don't quite see why well what equation would give you give you but also you know fundamentally equations builds polynomials to, to data right and so that implies you have inputs and outputs and so if there's no relationship in other words you you're not able to delineate what the inputs are and what the output quantity is then then i don't think you'd be able to use equations but um but my suggestion would just, you know, just try uh, some sort of um, uh, PCA initially, reduce the space of your uh, dimension and, and go from there. Because 500 does seem like quite a bit. Um, obviously, I, I know nothing of your application, but 500 is, is quite large. Um, okay, right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Farhana. We've also had a question from Alistair in the chat um, for Pranay, which is, can you explain how the subspace methods behave with correlated inputs? Yes, excellent question. Um, so uh, obviously everything uh, that underscores polynomial chaos expansions and indeed the construction of orthogonal polynomials in, uh, requires that your inputs be independent of each other. Um, that said, we have in the code, based once again on some really good stuff that's come out of Sandia National Labs, um, in particular a few papers by John Jakeman, um, on how to best construct orthogonal polynomials that can deal with uh, inputs that are correlated. Um, so we have that capability in the code. Um, and so um, if you're willing to give it a try, um, you know, uh, do, do let us know how you get on. Um, but uh, long story short, we we have to build a basis that is able to uh, make your in, uh, inputs independent um, or seemingly in independent, um, and then everything else ensues. Um, I should, uh, Alistair, um, on that particular uh, topic, we have quite a few posts in our discourse about dealing with correlated inputs. Um, so uh, that would be my first, uh, uh, um, I suppose if you if you have a case study in mind or if you have some, you know, problem that you're working on internally um, uh, pertaining to that, then um, I just quickly consult uh, some of the stuff that we have in the discourse. And then, um, and this goes for everyone on the call, you know, if you're using the code and you have an issue or if you have a query, uh, we have a discourse forum um, that folks quite routinely, uh, you know, post something in like, I don't know how to do A, B, and C, or could you advise on uh, D, E, and F? Um, obviously, you don't, you know, I understand that a lot of you work on proprietary items, so please don't post anything proprietary there. But, you know, um, if you have a general question about modeling or um, something pertaining to some results you're observing using the code, uh, we're, we're more than happy to diagnose. Because um, I think for a lot of these issues, we, it's, it's, it's helpful to, to see the code um, and, uh, and, and go from there. I think we've had David join. Um, so David, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, if you have one.
you're still on mute so i don't know if you're sort of trying to find the little button that says unmute ah, okay you're joining from your phone it's not working i'm surprising well if you'd like to ask a question just type up the question in the chat that might be a bit faster I, so, um, so David's question is, how sensitive were the results to turbulence levels, Prene? Oh, oh, that 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 oh, that that's very interesting. Um, uh, it varies, obviously, depending on on the case that one is running. Um, um, but it's tougher to build models when you're. Uh, it's it's tougher to build local polynomial models. Just to give you an example, a concrete example, downstream of. Um, uh, a simple airfoil. In other words, if I'm trying to fit a polynomial to some design variables and I'm trying to model the static pressure downstream of an airfoil, it's a lot more challenging than doing something uh, that's closer to the leading edge, just because obviously downstream of the airfoil, uh, once again, depending on the angle of attack, but for the most part, it, it, you know, uh, the turbulence does affect quantities that you might be interested in, therefore the quality of the polynomial that one can fit. Um, we have, however, written um, quite recently a physics of fluids paper uh, on how you can still build polynomial models, um, bearing in mind that they now have an uncertainty estimate. So there's a physics of fluids paper, there's an AIAA SciTech paper as well on, on those, those issues. Um, but once again, usually, you know, the, uh, I'd say, notionally at least, you know, increase the order of the polynomial. Um, that, that's one way to go about it. Um, obviously, things get... Oh, inherently a lot more nonlinear, but that's to be expected when you're modeling a lot of these turbulent uh, quantities um, or flow fields that are inherently turbulent. Um, so uh, yeah, once again, it, it really depends on, on the, the precise uh, case study. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, do we have any sort of last question? Sorry about that. Hoppin is being unpredictable. So I was just wondering if there were any last questions. Uh, and if not, we sort of have two minutes to the hour and I would just like to thank Prene for this fantastic lecture and uh, and the discussion and uh, yeah thank you all for uh, being so engaged and asking so many questions and I just wanted to remind you if you'd like to continue this conversation testing in quadratures downloading playing with it or any of that you can um, kind of request some time with any of us Prene or somebody from the research application management team to help you get onboarded and kind of test it on your machine and answer questions. So if you'd like any of any help with sort of um, trying this out, you can leave your details in the Google Doc that we shared, or you could just uh, email us. Um, so I'm just going to stick in the email address of my team, which um, is monitored regularly. So yeah, we'll get back to you. And uh, with that, um, thank you, everybody, and enjoy your afternoon. Um, so I, 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 the, the, I suppose one, one thing to, to mention is that we have this um, equadrature's workshop in the Midlands in Warwick uh, on the 31st. So for those folks who are interested in, in some of the things that they've seen, would like to learn more, um, it's a full day workshop um, with, with lunch and, and, and tea and coffee, of course. But um, it's a full day workshop um, at the University of Warwick. Um, and there's an Eventbrite uh, invitation uh, link that uh, well, you, well, that we're happy to, to, to share as well. Yeah, we can just post um, that Eventbrite into the Google Doc. So you just save the Google Doc link for your reference and we can kind of take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.